Okay, so we're over here. We're looking at four and three. Front carbon, carbon four. Front carbon, I see a methyl going straight up in the board. I'm going to make that ME. That's an ME there on the coming off. Yeah? Methyl. Carbon four, something's coming towards you guys, which is to my left. Iodine coming towards you guys. It's on my left. I see it coming to my left. I'm just drawing what I see. It's also a little bit down towards my feet. What else is on carbon four? I'm drawing hydrogen. It's going behind the board. Two in the plane, one forward, one back. Behind the board is to my right if I'm over here. That's the front carbon. Back carbon, three. I see a, uh, what's this group? Terbutyl. Terbutyl going straight down. What's on carbon three coming <coughs> towards you guys? Another methyl here, yeah? Coming towards you guys. If I'm over here, it's on my left. And it's going up a little bit. What else is on carbon three? H, going back on my right. There it is on, as originally shown on the board. Is this the best confirmation? Largest group on the front, I'd probably say this big iodine. Largest group on the back, the turk butyl group. Right now they're gauche. That's not good. Not as good as it could be. At least they're not. At least they're not eclipsed. I'm going to rotate this. Put the iodine straight up. Put the iodine up. That's going to turn the methyl here and the H here. The back is the same. Turn butyl here. H here, and methyl here. This is the best confirmation. The two largest groups are anti. In the best confirmation, what's the dihedral angle between the two methyl groups? 180. 180. <coughs> Questions? Pretty straightforward? Uh, was there a question up there in the third one? Uh, what is the dihedral angle between the methyl and terpbutyl groups? What's the dihedral angle between the methyl and terpbutyl? 60 degrees, yeah? Okay. Um, can a sin or gauss confirmation sometimes be preferred? Yes, there's always exceptions. We said anti, large groups anti is preferred, but here's an exception. This compound here prefers to exist in this confirmation with the two larger groups, the OH groups, actually being gauss to each other. Not anti. What's the rationale for this? Hydrogen bonding. Lone pair here, here. Hydrogen bonding between the oxygen of one group and the H of another. It's a very strong IMF. A non-covalent interaction, but it's still a stabilizing good thing. It's like a partial bond. Bonding is good. That interaction is good. What is that interaction? It's charges attracting. <coughs> charges attracting is a stabilizing thing. Pulling charges apart is a destabilizing thing. Take physics. Good course.
Anybody taking physics this semester? There's a reason for that, but it's very important. So there's an example of when the gauche is actually preferred because the molecule hanging out is like, woo, I want to hydrogen bonds so all hang out like this. Pulls those groups together and holds them there. The IMF uh, is, okay, this would be called intramolecular hydrogen bonding. Intra, internal. as opposed to intermolecular. Okay, that's it. That's exhibiting or illustrating that. Is the same type of hydrogen bonding possible in the following compound? First off, can you hydrogen bond, can this hydrogen bond compound bond to itself? Do you have an acceptor and a donor? Yes. Can it do an intramolecular? That is one molecule. Okay. See, I can hold my own hand. That'd be in, internal. Intramolecular. Yeah. Or I can hold her hand. And that would be intermolecular. Enter. Like an interstate goes between two different states, right? Can you show the hydrogen bonding here? Now, we're not going to do it in, in a Newman projection. Can we just show that? You need to be able to show, illustrate hydrogen bonding. Okay? What, what is going to be the acceptor and donor that we could show uh, coordinating by a hydrogen bond? Well, there's only one donor in the whole compound. It's the H here. It's only oxygen. Which acceptor is it going to most likely coordinate to? Tell me again. Nitrogen. Nitrogen? Which one? I assume the one in the top right of the benzene ring. The one closest? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to show this. Just yeah, kind of put the OH where the methyl is. In yeah, the we have free rotation. That's a signal bond. This can rotate. I'm going to redraw this. If I put the, like this, I'll draw this bond out. That's just where I took this, okay? Here we go. Thumb up, like this. I can just rotate this bond, thumb down, thumb up. Okay, that's all I did. But now, look what we can do. We can show a hydrogen bond between the nitrogen long pair and the H, that is, is the uh, donor there. We get it right? So that's illustrating a, another intramolecular hydrogen bond. That's sort of an extension or a little bit follow-up of what we did there. There's no Newman confirmation that I drew here, and I wouldn't expect it. You don't have to. We don't have to always draw a Newman. But we can show this. But that right there is probably going to make you would say, okay, is this OH likely down or up when it's just hanging out? Most likely probably up hydrogen bonding to that nitrogen. That's how it's hanging out on a Saturday afternoon. So in question E, that the back OH would be rotated upward and towards us? Like the way it's drawn in the Newman? This here? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, this is probably... Yeah, it's more like that. See, right here, I've really got this drawn anti. Because if you look down this bond, that one's up, that one's down. Right. But it's not. It's really turned up a little bit. Um, I mean, we can, we can draw these any way you want. I'd probably draw that if I was going to say, hey, look at this compound. But then we have to dig deeper and say, OK, if we want to talk about how these two groups are positioned, well, they like to come together and be closer, and they like to hydrogen bond, and we could show that like this in a Newman, or you could maybe even show it like this. Different ways to show it. Um, okay, need to be 
be able to go backwards. These are Newman's. You'd be able to go back and show maybe just a plain perspective drawing. This, this question is saying, can you name these? Uh, let's draw this in a perspective uh, real quick. We've got two carbons, front and back. Okay. Let's put the front carbon. On the front carbon, I see a methyl going straight up, right? Okay. Front carbon, I see a bromine to my right. Well, if I'm over here and a bromine's to the right, do I want to draw the bromine dash to bold? Bolded. So I can draw the bromine like this. The other thing on the front carbon, which is the butyl group, is the other way, so it's like this. One, two, three, four. That's the front carbon. If we did it, we could go the other way and get back there. Then the second carbon, I see an H straight down. Uh, we'll learn going forward, the back carbon is not chiral. The back carbon has two H's and an F. Everybody agree? There you go. That's, that's sufficient. There's no stereo chemistry here. We'll learn that going forward. Got two H's in the F. It's, it's there. Okay, name this compound. Uh, that looks a little odd because it's not completely line bond. That's okay. Longest continuous chain. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Which six is best? What's going to be our main main one? How do you break that tie? The most substitutions. The, the longest connecting carbon chain with the most substituents. Most substituents. Which has the most substituents? If I go through here and count the methyl, if I did that, it would have two substituents, this and this. If I came through here, one, two, three, four, five, six, it would have three substituents. The F, the bromine, and the methyl would be a substituent. So that's the best. Six. That's a hexane. What's on the hexane? First off, what's the one in? Here. Put the sub on the one. One, two. Uh, one fluoro, two bromo, two methyl. Alphabetical. Uh, we list these alphabetical. That would be a bromo. Two bromo, one. Fluoro, it's spelled U-O, fluoro, like fluorine. Fluoro, two methyl, hexane, one word. What we're not able to do yet is stereochemistry. For test two, we'll learn how to designate this particular stereochemistry here. For now, we're not doing that. So we went backwards there. So you can try the other one on your own. Confirmations of cyclohexanes. Cyclohexane confirmations is, a, is the second component to this handout. We do confirmations of alkanes with Newman's. With cyclohexanes, we do boat and chair confirmations. Actually, no boats. We, need, we first need to look at the uh, handout that you printed, Overview of Cycloalkane. This page here, as was covered on the nomenclature, you can have cycloalkane, cyclic alkane. And these are named like cyclopropane, cyclobutane, cyclopentane, cyclohexane. Perhaps the most common, at least at the beginning level for us. We will look at chair confirmations of cyclohexanes. First of all, intro. Uh, we can say about these two. These have what's called ring strength. Ninth grade geometry, what's that bond angle there? 60 degrees. 
but that's a tetrahedral carbon. There's two H's here, right? Right? It's supposed to be 109.5. That's the preferred. But it looks like 60. You've got some ring string here, it's called. Bond string, angle string. It's all the same thing. We take these bonds and make them come closer to make the ring. They have to, or can't make a ring. Right? Here we go. Let's make a ring, a three-membered ring. All right, and we're going to bond to you. Sorry, I like 109.5. Well, somehow this made a, made a ring. Oh, you got to do it too. Ring string. Oh, ring string. That's what you got here. Can it do it? Yes, it can. These are known. There's actually lots of cyclopropane rings in, in drugs. Um, how do we know their strain other than just knowing ninth grade geometry and it's not 109.5? We can look at uh, pizza formation. Pizza formation can be determined for compounds. You'll hopefully look at this in gen chem a little bit. Pizza formation for cyclopropane and butane are positive. Where for the others, negative. What is the heat of formation? That's the energy that's taken in or released whenever the molecule is made from the elements. Okay? Carbon plus hydrogen to give that, those hydrocarbons. Usually when you make all these covalent bonds, it's exothermic. Negative numbers. But when you make those two, it's endothermic. You have to put energy in to make those. Why? Because it ain't going to be made unless you put some energy in and force these bonds together. Help me, help. give me some energy. Okay, all that energy came in. That's why these are positive, endothermic. We can see that. Heat of formation, you know, you need to know what a heat of formation is and how to use those numbers. Still can be made though. By the way, there's more discussion to that three-member green. Uh, about what actually what type of angles are there. What's really going on is the, the sigma bonds between the two carbons in the ring are not head-to-head. -head. They can't be. They're not head-to-head. -head. Well, the sigma bonds are actually like this. And so it's a weaker bond. Okay? It's like that because of ninth grade geometry. All right? So there's a lot more going on to that that we have time to talk about. HF is important. We see that they're endothermic. It takes energy to make those two. By the way, we'll say this again. I should say it now for the first time. The best size rings are your five and six. Five and six are your best size rings. They have the more appropriate 109.5 bonding. Actually, your larger rings are not good. Okay, like your eight-membered ring. Problem with them is, okay, is you try to make a bond and it's just too wide. Now you might say, well, why aren't those endothermic? Because there's multiple things going on. There's so many bonds being made. In fact, there's so many bonds compensates for the fact that it's not a good ring size. And so it becomes still exothermic. In the end, what size rings are best? We'll say that many times in the future, especially in, also in organic too. Is there a question? The last two, the biggest ones, cyclodecane has a higher total strain energy. How is that? Why is that? Well, there's, it gets complex. There's multiple things going on there. Again, one thing that you have to account for is this just has more carbon carbon bonds. And more bonds is better, but it's a bigger ring. But, but perhaps the more bonds is a better thing than the ring is a bad thing. And so it's complex. It's easier to just look at the first two. Again, you might expect these to be endothermic, but they're not because there's just so many carbon carbon bonds being made, and that's a good thing that compensates for the bad thing. 
But if you just look at a ring size, the best size rings are what? Yes. Okay, intro to dye substitute. Of course, if you just have something like that, that's called methyl cyclohexane. You don't even need the one because it's, it, the one position is by default here. What if you have two methyl groups? Dye substituted. Now we have potential for isomers. This would be one, two. Okay, numbering one, and the next one is at the two. This would be one, three. You can start anywhere you want. If this is one, that's three. And this one is, of course, one, two, three, four. Three different constitutional isomers because they have different connectivity. And since they have different connectivity, they have different names. Constitutional isomers have different names because they have different connectivity. All right? So understanding the potential for isomers there. We also have stereo isomers possible. For example, let's look at the 1, 2. The 1, 2 can be either like this, both being projected forward, and we would call this cis. Cis meaning same side. Cis. Well, that's also cis. They're just both back. <coughs> now, this is actually the same exact compound. Those two are the same exact compound. We'll be doing that type of stuff during test two and understanding why. And we may actually look back at this exact page. On the other hand, we can have the trans isomers. That's where the groups are opposite. One's forward, one's back. That would be called trans one, two. This is also trans one, two. In this case, these are different compounds. Right? These would be called stereoisomers. Okay, stereoisomers. And there's actually three stereoisomers of the 1, 2 dimethyl. That one, that one, and that one. That's just the same compound. Okay? Stereoisomers have the same exact name. These are all 1, 2 dimethyl cyclohexane. They're all that name, yeah? Stereoisomers have the same exact name. Because they have the same connectivity. Stereoisomers just differ in their projection in space, how the groups are projected. Okay? Um, so that's a little bit of intro. Again, we'll see, we'll see stereochemistry or stereoisomers during test two. This is just a little prelude to that. What you need to be able to do here is compare the stereoisomers to the constitutional isomers and understand what each are. Uh, this just shows some drugs with cycloalkanes, like a cyclopentane, cyclopropane. Lots of drugs contain cyclopropane. Boom, boom. Here's a nice cyclohexane with two substituents on the same carbon. Here's a nice one with three substituents, one, two, and three. There's a little comment about this three-membered ring down here. <coughs> That's where I alluded to. And actually, the sigma bond is not head-to-head. -head. It's a little bit not so head-to-head. Okay, we need to look at uh, chair confirmations. This is on the back, number two, purple. Uh, we have a cyclohexane here with a broken bond.
six carbons. Okay, but we're going to bring it back and bond, bond it together here. Now we have a six-membered ring. We have one substituent there. Uh, how is this ring? If we draw it on the board, it looks flat, yeah? Some of those drugs, it just looks plain flat. It's not flat. Uh, that would be flat, like that. That's a six-membered ring flat. Flat on the board, yeah? Um, yeah, if we drew cyclohexane, we would draw it like this. It's not really flat. Each carbon is sp3, tetrahedral. Okay? And if you drew the H's there, two in the plane, you would put one forward and one back. Still, that doesn't make it not flat because it could still be flat and all H's forward and all H's back. Let's look at it in real life as shown by a model here. Uh, if we make it flat, that is, okay, flat on the board, all H is either forward or back. Like that. Try to make it flat. Let's look at the neighboring carbons or H's. Okay, here it all, here it all is all flat. Okay? The neighboring H's, are they... Eclipsed or staggered? Eclipsed. They're eclipsed. Yes. Also, from ninth grade geometry, what's this bonding? I can't remember ninth grade geometry, but I think it's 120. It must be 109.5. That's ideal. Instead of it being flat, what happens is. It puckers. For example, one end pulls up and one end pulls down, maybe. Now, only four of them are on the board. This carbon is coming towards, see, the hand is supposed to be the board. I know it's a little bit difficult to see these small models. That's coming forward where this one down here is going back. That's how, that's more preferred. Now, if we look at two carbons, here's an H. And the one on the adjacent carbon are now staggered, no longer eclipsed because of what we just did. And the bonding angles are more 109.5. And this is how it's going to exist. So really, all six, six H's forward, six H's back, no. We put this down, how many H's are hitting the table? For those who can see. The answer is only three. Only three are straightforward, not six. Uh, in the end, you have to have a model in your hand if you want to look at some of this stuff closer. Let's draw some stuff on the board. By the way, the only thing that's flat, benzene ring is flat. That's a benzene ring model. And the <coughs> benzene ring, of course, has the double bonds in it. Boom, boom, boom. But now each carbon is trigonal planar. All six are planar. Thus, they're all in one plane. They're all flat on the board. Okay? These are tetrahedral, leading to this. Uh, now, one thing. You cannot rotate this like we did over here, like this. You cannot do that with a ring. We would just it all up, okay? Can't do that. What you can do though is you can sort of go back and forth like this, all right, up and down type thing. But this up and down is the types of conformations that we can do with the cyclohexane. Let me go ahead and show this. If you put both of the ends up like that, okay, both of the ends up, that's called a boat conformation. It's like an Italian gondola, the boat with the two ends are both up. All right? You can do that, but that's not the best. Main reason because these two H's up here or any groups start kind of clashing. By the way, I don't think we've used the term. When groups clash, that's called sterics. Steric interactions, you see that term in your textbook? Okay. 
groups, the electrons, uh, the groups interacting, not good. Steric clash, steric interactions, bad. Sterics are the two hydrogens here. Instead, one end is up and the other end goes down. Oh, that, that bond is kind of broken there. And this is more like a chair. You sit here and here's your back and your feet, your legs can spill over onto the, the leg rest. Okay? Chair confirmation. Let's draw these on the board. How do you draw a chair? And we will never talk about boat again. <laughs> chair confirmation. How do you draw this? What's a more appropriate view of this? Here we go. Two lines, a little bit offset and parallel, like this. There's four carbons right there. We just need two more carbons. We're going to connect this carbon and this carbon with a up-down. We're going to connect this carbon and this carbon with a, like this. <coughs> there you go. There's a chair confirmation. You sit here, your back is here, okay, I can't draw. Uh, you, you know, and feet over here. Um, your feet hanging down. It's, okay. Everybody get what we did there? We put two parallel lines, a little bit offset like this, and then we connected them. There you go. Sometimes it's going to look good, sometimes it's not going to look so good, and you want to redraw it. All right? That's kind of not pointed. It should be a little bit more pointed. It ended up being rounded. Okay, this one looks better over here. All right, each carbon has two H's. Because each carbon is SP3, each, okay? CH2. How do you draw those in? Up carbons. That's an up carbon here and here. Where these three are sort of down, you can get a little stereo view. Up carbon is straight up bonds. Straight up H, straight up H, straight up H. Sort of like this. This H can be drawn below that bond or you can make it a little higher. I'm probably going to put it below that bond. The other three carbons I call down carbons. These are going to get straight down bonds. Three, three straight up, three straight down. Look, if you take this with a chair confirmation and sit it on the table, it's a little bit skewed a little bit because it's been bent. How many H's are you hitting the table straight down? Three. Yeah. If you turn it over, how many are you hitting the table straight down? Three. Three up, three down. That's this. The table would be down here, and these three would be hitting the table. Okay? Now, how do you draw the other ones? Let's look at this. Straight down. This one's straight down. The other one on that carbon is not going straight up. How is it going? It's going out to the side. That one's going straight up. The other one's not going straight down. How's the other one going? Out to the side. A little bit down, but not straight down. One is always straight up or down. That's called axial. Okay, up, down, or your axial hydrogens, your axial positions. And then the ones that are going to the side are called equatorial, like equator. How do you draw those in? Well, each one has, each carbon has an axial and an equatorial. We drew all the axes. Now let's draw the equatorial here. It's drawn this way, but we've got to be very precise. It should be parallel with not the carbon-carbon bond that's connected to that carbon, but the next one. This bond should be parallel to this carbon-carbon bond, so it comes off like this. And 
that and that are parallel. It's supposed to be. Here, it comes off this way, but it's supposed to be parallel not to that or that, but the next one. It's supposed to be parallel to that. Or if you went this way, this. You see how these two are the same? This H should be like these two. And so it comes up like this. It's not gonna, it doesn't have to be perfect, but these two are supposed to be parallel. And both of these are equatorial. All right, let's draw the rest in. This one here might be one of the tougher ones, uh, or maybe not. Not parallel to that, but this. That's supposed to be parallel to this. If you're not careful, it will almost look like it's coming straight down, but we know it should not be. That's an up carbon, that's a straight up H, and then an equatorial H. Here. You with me? You draw that one in there. <coughs> this one should be parallel to, to that. And they all come out away. Uh, you, would not, you would not draw this H like this. Yes, it's parallel, but that's a horrendous bond angle there. Um, it's going to come this way. And these two are supposed to be parallel. Here, this is going to come here, like this. These two are supposed to be parallel. Back here, it's going to go this way, but not straight up. It needs to be parallel to that. It's almost going to look straight up. That should be parallel to this and that. But we know that's a down carbon, straight down, and that's the equatorial age. Here you go. This is a chair confirmation of cyclohexane. Hold it in my hand. I wish these were bigger here. H straight up, and then this H coming to the side here. That H is straight down, and then you got one coming to the side here. Now you can't see the full 3D, but this bonding here is supposed to be in front of that back there. Okay. Yes. That H at the top in the middle, what is it parallel to? Yes, that one. Not the connecting carbon carbon bond, but the next one. <coughs> Not the connecting one, but the next one. Okay. Um, let's just get straight to some problems. That'll help guide our discussion. We're getting short on time here. Uh, identify each as cis or trans. Okay. we should do a ring flip. I'm going to start this hydrogen here. So-called ring flip. Ring flip is where you, okay, here's the original chair. We can do a, a ring flip, which is moving to a different conformation. This is coming down. Let's move this up and move this one down. We sort of invert the chair. Okay, and that can go back and forth. Up, down. Let's do that on the board. Um, I reckon we can do it here. I feel like it would be best to do it that side, but I don't have enough space. Okay, that one we started like that. Here, let's do it like this, just the opposite. Let's come this way. Is 
that might be a little bit too 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 vertical maybe. Uh, connect these and connect these. Uh, that's a straight up H, that's a straight up H, that's a straight up H. So those are up carbons, that's a down carbon, that's a down carbon, that's a down carbon. The rest are equatorial, this is going to be parallel to this, parallel to that, uh, parallel to that there. It's almost going to look straight down. There. I did a ring flip. I pulled this point down and I pushed that point up. Where's the start H at now over here? Which H should be star? Which what's the same H over here? <clears throat> this one right here, that's the same H. At that point up there, we pulled it down, okay? It's now down. <coughs> and the H is now there. The H over there is axial, it's now equatorial. We can put a green group here. That's that. Let's pull this end down and this end up. And now this should be this. And now this is the point. It's coming down. It's not coming quite so much down in my model. But now that H is equatorial. Yeah. Okay. Take home here is whenever you do a ring flip, axials become equatorial. And equatorials go to axial. Okay? Uh, are these H's here cis or trans? But we have to, uh, these H's are cis to each other. And these H's are trans to each other. The two that are cis. And small. But that's supposed to be it. There. The two H's that are cis, I've got green and blue. Okay? If I took this and made it flat, if we drew it flat on the board, both of those H's are coming towards it. Okay. So if we drew it flat on the board, we could draw that same thing flat and say, okay, we know it's really all this puckered and big stuff. If we drew the H's, we would put them one here, and we would put the other one, not next door, but three, so one three, and we would put it here. 
And that's how you would show it in a more standard perspective drawing. Okay? Uh, but these are trans. Easiest way for, to tell if these are cis or trans is, look at them. This H is up compared to the other H. That H is up compared to the other H. They're both up. They're cis. This H is up compared to the other H. That one's down compared to the other H. These two are trans. That's how you do that, no matter where the groups are positioned. Now, some books or TAs will tell you many, many ways to memorize things. Don't do that. I just told you how to do it. All right? And it works out all the time. You don't have to memorize 18 different scenarios. What I just told you is work. And it's on camera. Please rewatch it. Okay? All right? Well, some people like to say, well, if it's one four and it's this, then it's going to be that. Or you can just do what I just told you. Okay? Please, move. Please be doing some of the problems there. Finish up that page and we'll get those real quick on Monday. Did our test is on Wednesday, yeah?